This is QTV News. I am Marietu Sidibe and thanks for joining us. First, the main local, business and international news headlines. In local news, three years Jadna members appear again in court and again fail to get their bail application resolved. Today is International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM. We hear the Gambian perspective. A former governor of Central River Region, Ganyi Truri, testifies at the TRRC on allegations made against him by followers of Seringdigal of Kermot Ali Village. In business news, Angela Merkel heads to Africa with trade at the top of the agenda. Also in business news, renewable energy. We hear how Cape Verde is leading the way for Africa. In international news, FGM is a problem in Europe too. And now, the local news in detail. On Thursday, the High Court adjourned a ruling on the bail application filed by defense lawyers of the eight accused three years Jatna members. Two hearings are now set for next week. Momodo Lamin Choi was at the High Court and he now reports. It is another day for the accused who are remanded at mile two by the Canifing Magistrate Court pending a final judgment on the offenses they stand alleged. What seems to be a show of solidarity by supporters of the accused and their families can be seen outside the court premises. The High Court is expected to deliver a ruling on the bail application and Justice Aminata Saho Sise is to give a ruling after both defense and prosecution submitted arguments last Tuesday. In considering the application, Justice Sise tells the court that the High Court must be guided by various factors, including the nature of the offense committed, criminal records of the accused, the likelihood of them jumping bail, and the possibility of witness interference. Justice Caesar also informs the court that the lead defense counsel for the accused only made an oral application without putting before her conditions of the accused presence favorable to the granting of bail. The defense team is now asked to do a formal application after they failed to put the required conditions to guide the judge's decision on the bail application. The high court judge concluded that it is the court's intention to conduct the case with speed and efficiency. The case was then adjourned to next week, Tuesday and Friday, for hearings and subsequent ruling. I'm feeling good. I'm really good. Thank you for the media. Whatever judgment comes, we still strong. While the accused persons have now gone back to the remand wing of Mile 2 prisons to await the final hearings and ruling on a bail application, which will either be granted or rejected, the defense counsels are now to go back afresh and follow the right procedure for the bail application. Still agitated and charged, though, the supporters of the accused and their families are going home with some hope for justice sooner rather than later. Choi for QTV News. Today is International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation. February 6th every year is a day set aside by the UN General Assembly to intensify efforts to eliminate of the practice. Our reporter Bintu Koka attended a press conference organized by the Women's Bureau in honor of the day. The theme for this year's International Day of Zero Tolerance for Female Genital Mutilation and Cutting is Unleashing Youth Power. The practice is perceived by many as a violation of the basic human rights for women and girls. According to the World Health Organization, 30 countries mainly in Africa, the Middle East and Asia practice FGM, and the Gambia is not an exception. The main law criminalizing FGM in the Gambia is the Women's Amendment Act 2015. Kunle Adeneyi, UNFPA country rep, speaks of the need to bring in policies which will end FGM. We need to strengthen our policies and engagement. We have laws 
very proud of the Gambia. We have law criminalizing female genital mutilation and even child marriage and other issues around that. But we need to make sure that policies work. And aside from the law, policies at the level of the ministry, working together with other ministries and that affect the girl child. Education policies, how do girls return to school? How do we make sure that the girl is enrolled in school and stays in school? Because research has shown that when a girl goes to school, she has less chances of her rights being violated. The second thing is funding linked with policy. The ministry has done so much effort. The Minister of Women Affairs, Children and Social Welfare, Fatu Kinte, shares a message to the people who still believe in FGM. Here in the Gambia, we have come very far. FGM, as we all know, is a deep rooted traditional belief and practice. Sometimes um, there are misconceptions that it's a religious belief and practice. But what is clear is that FGM is older than both Islam and Christianity. It is entrenched in our cultures. And um, it's not a religious belief because we all are aware that we have Muslims in the Gambia who don't perform FGM. There are also non Muslims who perform FGM. She further gave statistics on the reduction of FGM in the Gambia. As of 2009, the figure was at 92%. When we started the program, with NFPA and UNICEF through the joint program. But in, in 2013, when we did the um, DHS, the Demographic Health Survey, we discovered that it has dropped to 75% prevalence rate, but awareness rate is at 90, 90%. Last year, 2019, um, UNICEF did the mixed survey, that is multiple indicator and cluster survey. That revealed still a 90% awareness rate, but then prevalence has dropped, more especially among girls 0 to 15, it has dropped to um, uh, 53%, which we all agree is a remarkable achievement. FGM can lead to immediate health risk as well as a variety of long-term complications affecting women's physical, mental and sexual health. Bintu Koka, QTV News. The former governor of Central River Region, Ganyi Ture, testified on Thursday at the TRRC on allegations made against him by followers of Serindigal of Kermot Ali Village on the role he played leading to their exile while he was governor of CRR. The story is by Babu Karsi and is narrated by Ansumane Esonyase. Ganyi Ture, a former governor of Central River Region, began his testimony by telling commissioners that he knew Sering Digal very well and that the religion Digal practices is neither Christianity nor Islam. He said the Digal sect said they have stopped performing the five daily prayers and they also used their mosque for singing and dancing. Do Islam, do, 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 do Christianity, do ben, ben, I know that it was not Islam, it was not also Christianity, it was their own religion. What I observed was that one, if you are a Muslim and you close a mosque, a mosque that was built by your father, and you said that that is going to be your own place of activity, and this activity is basically to put men and women together, drumming and uh, having their time inside the mosque. I have those photographs in my mobile phone. As governor of the region at the time, Ganyature said he lived with them despite their bizarre way of worshipping. After a few months after Ndigal's death, in 2007, a delegation from Senegal came to meet him, introducing Sering Mohamed Bashir Sek as the new leader of Kermot Ali village. Mr. Ture said problems in the village started when Digal's followers refused the new leader's request to refurbish the village mosque, which was closed. Ture said he then received an executive order from the office of the president to take care of the situation. After a failed negotiation with Digal's people, Ture said he consulted his superiors for permission to use the security forces to exile Ndigal's followers from the country to allow the mosque to reopen. After being questioned by the lead council about the illegality of chasing people out of their country, 
the former governor accepted that the order was unlawful, but said he was acting on executive orders. You should use all your resources exactly. and facilitate the police and, if necessary, yes. the army yes. for all followers of Ndigal and Ndigal himself to leave Gambian soil. That was your order. Yes. And we saying it is unlawful. And I said yes. Thank you. And I said yes. Yeah, I you thank you. I said uh, it was unlawful to, 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 to remove somebody from, from, from his home. But uh, for me, it was an order, and I think the order was lawful, and I executed the order. Former Governor Twitter denied that the arrested SEC members were detained for 21 days while strongly maintaining that he acted on executive orders. He concluded by telling the commission that he did not regret sending legal Senegalese followers back to Senegal. Antoine Esonyasi, Foki TV News. Currently on a tour of tourism facilities, officials of the Ministry of Tourism and Culture, led by Minister Hamad Ba, on Wednesday visited two popular historical sites in Wasu and Kerbach. As Alusisa reports, officials revealed plans to upgrade the sites to attract more visitors. Kerbach Stone Circles in the Nyanaja District, Central River Region, is a UNESCO heritage site. It is one of the close to 10,000 stone circle sites in the Gambia, particularly in the north bank of the country. Hasim Suse, historian and director general of the National Center for Arts and Culture, explains what makes Kerbach stone circle special. It's basically, um, we have what is called the liar stone, that's L-Y-R-E. Um, all the stones you know, are upright, uh, but this one you know, has a V-ship. And still now, as you know, I mean, neither the historians nor the archaeologists, you know, can explain. But what you know, we agree on is that the stone circles were burial sites. For who? Maybe for important people in society. You mean like nobles, you know, warriors, you know, sages. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean you know, people who were notable, you know, like in society. You know, we have 10,000 sites like this in the country. But because we cannot maintain all the 10,000, we maintain Wasu you know, and Kirbach. But there are other sites, you know, some maybe in fact like more beautiful than these ones. In response to the appeal by the locals to have the place fenced and the existing structure rehabilitated, DGC reveals the plans his office has to transform these and other places such as Wasu Stone Circles. Aim now um, is really to upgrade um, the site to have a perimeter fence and also you know, to construct a museum in which we will display the history and culture of the people you know, of this locality and also to say something about the significance of the circle itself. So as to promote it into a tourism product, like to generate jobs, you know, employment, you know, of course, and also contribution to the local economy. There was a museum collection at Kerbach, but due to destruction to the buildings, the NCAC boss said the artifacts were relocated to Wasu. He promises the people of Nyanija that this will be returned soon when the buildings are rehabilitated. Access to the site is extremely difficult as visitors struggle to travel on a bumpy road. Tourism and Culture Minister Hamad Nkeba said efforts are underway to construct the road linking several villages in the area. We believe when that road is constructed, it will make a difference to the life of the people who live within the vicinity and also encourage trade and indeed promote tourism. You know the importance of this site. This is a world heritage site by UNESCO. It's something that everybody believes is unique. This is what you have in Egypt and many other countries. And we believe that Gambians once again need to know about their history. Once the facilities are improved, people will be able to come with their families so their children what we have here. According to him, as part of the tourism expansion program, young people are being trained through GTHI for future management of these historical sites. The delegation also visited the stone circles in Wasu, where a similar meeting with the local leaders was held on how to transform the place. The stone circles have been and continue to attract visitors, both tourists and students. Reporting for QTV News, I am Aliou Sise. 
The Ministry of Women, Children and Social Welfare and the Ministry of Interior, in partnership with the International Organization for Migrants, on Thursday launched the National Referral Mechanism for the Protection and Assistance of Vulnerable Migrants in the Gambia. QTV's Ansumana Eswenyasi was there and he now reports. The two ministries and the International Organization for Migrants, supported by the USA and the EU, are expected to develop a framework that will complement national efforts to combat trafficking in persons in the Gambia and serve as a guideline for government in providing assistance for migrants. The Minister of Women's Affairs, Children and Social Welfare, Fatou Kinte, says the national referral mechanism will play a vital role in optimizing support to migrant returnees and contribute to the country's stability and security. We will work together diligently to improve cooperation and coordination among all partners working to support vulnerable migrants and victims of trafficking from the time when, they, when their needs and protections are identified to the time of reintegration into their communities. Fumiko Nagano, IOM Chief of Mission in the Gambia, says once completed, the national referral mechanism will help facilitate the return and reintegration of Gambian migrants. Indeed, all stakeholders have a very important role to play in the identification and the referral of vulnerable migrants, particularly victims of trafficking. Without identification and referral, there can ultimately be no justice for those that fall victim to trafficking in persons and no deterrent for those that profit from such a heinous crime. The United States Ambassador Richard Carl Pascal and the EU Ambassador Attila Lajos expressed the EU and the U.S. government's commitment to supporting the Gambia government in its drive to formulating an all-inclusive national referral mechanism policy that will help curb challenges faced in addressing migrant needs. I and my team at the U.S. Embassy have been working hard in partnership with our IOM colleagues to urge and to support Gambian government efforts to tackle the issues related to the exploitation of human beings within the Gambia's borders and beyond. It is our sincere hope that our collective efforts will improve the tip tier ranking on the 2020 report so that we can resume these important programs. With EU support, the government of Gambia and IOM have been working to facilitate the assisted and humanitarian voluntary return of Gambian migrants stranded in different transit countries. This collaboration resulted in the return of more than 5,000 returnees from January 2017 till end of 2019. The National Referral Mechanism also aims to map out all available services and institutionalize a national referral process to connect victims of trafficking to support services. And Sumane Soinyasi for QTV News. We will go with a short commercial break and when we come back, in business news, we hear why business and trade atop the agenda of Angela Merkel's Southern Africa visit. And in international news, on the day designated for zero tolerance of FGM, we look at some fighting to end it in Europe and Africa. Join us after the break for these stories, sports news and more. QCell is at it again with its brand new free mobile app. Oh yes, now you can access the wonderful world of QCell with the new app and get all your favorite services on the app. There's no need to remember any codes. Fantastic, no more codes. And even better, with the new app, you can live stream QTV and listen to Q Radio on your phone, anywhere, anytime. Yes, listen to Q Radio Live, purchase your Q Power tokens, use your Q Money wallet, and do much more all for free on the app. Go now and download the app for free from Play Store or the App Store. And you can get 30 days free QTV streaming once you download the app. It's unbelievable. Yeah, that's because it's QCell, the network you trust for great things. QCell, a decade of innovation. A lifetime of trust.
business news. Angela Merkel focuses on migration, trade on trip to South Africa and Angola. Angela Merkel's visit to South Africa has been seen by analysts as a sign that the two nations are almost back to being the close allies they once were. The relationship between the two countries cooled considerably during the latter period of former South African President Zuma's term of office. Since effectively forcing his scandal-ridden predecessor out of office, President Cyril Ramaphosa has already made a trip to Germany and in turn played host to German President Frank Walder Steinmeier. South Africa was Germany's most important political and training partner in Africa before the Zuma era. South Africa is Germany's most important trading partner in Africa and receives two-thirds of all German investments on the continent. In terms of foreign policy, both countries took a similar stance on global issues, including support for establishing the International Criminal Court in The Hague. Now both countries are currently members of the United Nations Security Council. Furthermore, South Africa is to take over the presidency of the African Union this month, while Germany assumes the presidency of the European Council in autumn. Both governments are also working together on the Compact with Africa initiative, which Germany launched during its G20 presidency in 2017. Africa's smallest nation by population is out to demonstrate that size isn't everything. While the race to rely solely on renewable energy is heating up around the world, the tiny African nation of Cape Verde is leading the charge for the continent. The country is turning to wind, water and sunshine to keep the lights on. When the government of Cape Verde set out to be the first African country to be reliant on renewable energy, few analysts took them seriously. However, the West African country, with a population of just over half a million, which is 400 kilometers off the coast of Senegal, appears to be on track to hit its targets of using 50% renewable energy by 2030 and 100% by 2050. Already, wind and solar energy plants are feeding into the grids of the nine inhabited islands of this nation. The regional body, ECOWAS, has decided to base its renewable energy agency in Cape Verde. They say they are doing this because all can learn from the fact that, given the amount of wind and sun, this was the first African nation to come up with a viable policy. In international news, FGM an imported problem in Europe, for many who have undergone it, it usually causes lifelong physical and psychological damage. Female genital mutilation, or FGM, is illegal in European Union, but a half million women and girls are thought to be affected. Many Africans living in Europe have taken the practice with them as part of their culture, in the same way they have brought the modes of dress and cuisine from their home countries. In France, a group of women is fighting to end the practice by young and old working together. For the young ones, this means using YouTube to inform all the youngsters and the wider world of the dangers inherent in the practice. In Africa, young women are not leaving it to government or NGOs. They are rallying to add their voices to end the practice. Also banned in many African countries, enforcement of the law remains weak and the battle goes on to end the practice. Here to give us the latest sports news is Ansumane Esonyasi. Eso, what do you have for us from the sporting world? Well, thank you very much, Marietu. Now, a childhood dream made possible. Nigerian international striker Odion Igalo has joined his dream club, Manchester United, on loan from Shanghai Sinhua until the end of the season. Now, I'm excited. I mean, Igalo told the club official website that he took a pay cut to make his childhood dream come true. I'm very happy. Uh, first, I want to say I thank God for making this happening and it's just like a dream come true for me because uh, I know many people used to say 
when they join the team, they say that they dream of playing the team. You know, mine was not the case. Mine is I supported the team when I was young. People that knows me, even back in Nigeria, everywhere, even when I was playing in Watford, my teammate knows that. I love my United. I support them when they play, even when we play against them. Odion Igalo, they are making no secret of his excitement to join Manchester United. Now, over now to Uganda, as the world football governing body FIFA has banned Ugandan player George Mandela for life for his alleged involvement in um, match, I mean, manipulation while he was playing for a Kenyan club. Kakamega home boys. Now three of his other Kenyan teammates have also been slapped with four-year bans each for their involvement in the said conspiracy. Now FIFA have explained in a statement that Mandela has been banned for life. The decision was informed by the fact that he played a very central role in the entire saga. Well I'm afraid that's all we have for you for sports today. Thank you very much, Esso. Before we end this bulletin, let's take a quick look at our main stories. In local news, three years Jodna members appear again in court and again fail to get their bail application resolved. Today is International Day of Zero Tolerance for FGM. We hear the Gambian perspective. A former governor of Central River Region, Ganyi Ture, testifies at the TRRC on allegations made against him by followers of Serindigal of Kermod Ali Village. In business news, Angela Merkel heads to Africa with trade at the top of the agenda. Renewable energy, we hear how Cape Verde is leading the way for Africa. In international news, FGM is a problem in Europe too. That's all we have for you in this edition of the news. Join us tomorrow for more news. Thank you for watching.